I, I, I'm pretty sure I have sound. Okay. <clears throat> All right, uh, 30 second warning. Class. <laughs> I'm showing my age. <clears throat> Hey, I saw that you're passing notes in class here, you know? Well, I'm not passing notes. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know about that. All right, I'm going to send you to the principal's office here. Oh, I know where it is. Okay. <laughs> There's a well-worn path, is that what you're saying? Well, good morning. Several years ago, which is, of course, another way of saying once upon a time, but, you know, not so long ago, an American was on a long business trip to Austria. He had a weekend free, so he decided to just walk around Vienna, enjoying the sights, the food, the architecture, and the culture. As the day was coming to a close, he decided to take a shortcut through the Central Cemetery to get back to his hotel. Well, much to his surprise, he walked right past the resting place of Beethoven. He stopped and examined the imposing marker. It's a gleaming white obelisk, about 10 feet tall. As the man stood there admiring the memorial to the great composer, thinking of how much he enjoys Ludwig's great symphonies, one of the cemetery's docents greeted him. Good evening, sir, the docent said. And since I'm lousy at accents, that's the last time I'll even try. <clears throat> I see you have an appreciation for one of our most honored guests. Indeed I do, said the businessman. Well, it may interest you to know that this is the third grave for Herr Beethoven. He died on the 26th of March, 1827, in Vienna, and was buried a couple of days later in a cemetery in one of the city's outlying districts. Then in 1863, the authorities decided to repair his burial site. They exhumed his body and put it in a new and better metal coffin before burying him again. Unfortunately, that cemetery closed in 1873, eventually converting to a park in the mid-1920s. Before they could convert the cemetery to a park, the docent continued, they had to relocate the graves, and Beethoven's was moved in 1888. They dug him up again and reburied his remains in one of the honorary graves here at Vienna's main cemetery. Third time's a charm, one might say, as he's been left to rest here ever since. Schubert suffered the same fate, but at least both fared better than Mozart. Ah, yes, the American replied. I'm familiar with Mozart's sad story. The two men stood silently for a moment. Then the docent said, well, sir, the cemetery closes in five minutes. Thank you for visiting and have a pleasant evening. I will, said the businessman. Thank you for a delightful chat. With that, the docent walked away. The businessman stood for another minute or two, his thoughts drifting from mortality of man to the tasks that lay ahead on the rest of his business trip. And as he was about to turn away, he noticed a small light coming from the ground at the, at the base of his headstone. He hadn't noticed it before, but as the sky grew dimmer, the light became more evident. Curious, he approached the light. There was no evident light fixture or a light bulb. The light seemed to be coming from a simple hole in the ground. So the man knelt down to get a closer look. Much to his surprise, he could clearly see that the hole led to a sizable cavern. What was this doing at, the, at, at Beethoven's grave, he wondered. In the cavern, an old man with long, disheveled white hair sat at a desk, furiously erasing page after page of sheet music. Stunned at what he saw, businessmen stood upright, looked around, and spotted the docent walking toward the exit. The ran to, businessman ran to him, grabbed him by the arm, spun him around, and breathless, he said excitedly, uh, Beethoven's grave, there's a light coming from a hole in the ground. There's an old man down there. He's racing music. What's... And, and the, before the American could say another word, the docent interrupted him and said, Sir, sir, settle down, please, relax. It's Beethoven. He's decomposing. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. <laughs> really, I'm, I'm really sorry about that. I know it's, it's too early. My, anyway... <clears throat> Before I get pelted from the peanut gallery, I think I ought to pray and get on with a lesson here. So, Father in heaven, thank you so much for this day, Lord. We thank you for the beautiful morning you've given us, Lord, and the blessings that we've enjoyed so far today, Lord, as short, uh, early as it may be, Lord. And 
We pray, Lord, that, uh, and I pray especially, Lord, that you'll, uh, you'll guide me as I teach this lesson, have the, the points of the lesson be clear, and uh, have us to understand the importance of, of what we're to learn. But also, Lord, just have us to enjoy uh, learning about you and, uh, and what you've done for us, and, and a little bit more about your word and, and uh, the importance that it should have in our lives and those of, of the lives of those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so, uh, for those of you who are new here this morning, uh, there will be a pop quiz from yesterday's, so, you know, we'll, we'll expect good performance anyway. But uh, this morning, we'll be covering the fourth lesson in our series of, that studies the Synoptic Bibles. That the, you know, there's, I think the title of the, the lessons are, uh, uh, what, what are the title? It, it guess, what is the title of it again? It's something about the three stories, one por three portraits, one story. That's what it is? I, I always get those backwards. Uh, three portraits, one story. And today's lesson is the Gospel of Luke, Jesus, the Son of Man. So as we've done for the last two uh, lessons, we're going to first start out talking about the authorship, the authorship of Luke. As with the Gospel of Mark, the Bible does not definitively identify Luke as the author of this Gospel. But the testimony of the early church writers clearly recognized Luke, the beloved physician and companion of Paul, as the author. Through the centuries, Bible scholars have readily supported this conclusion. So, let's now talk about Luke the minister. Now, I learned something here, and I'm hoping I'm not the only one who didn't know this, but according to the author of our study, Luke's nationality is not certain. It is entirely possible, and maybe even likely, that Luke himself was a Gentile. Let's look at Colossians chapter 4, verses 7, 8, and 9. <clears throat> All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother, and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are no done here. Notice that there is a period after verse 9. So that, that completes a list. Now Paul starts another list in verse 10. Aristarchus... Aristarchus, my fellow, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom ye received commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. And Jesus, which, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision, these are only my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Paul lists Aristarchus, Marcus, and Justice as being of the circumcision, that is, as Jews, distinguishing them from the, those mentioned in the first list, which are likely Gentiles. Now look at verse 14. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. By not including Luke among the short list of Jews in verses 10 and 11, was Paul stating or implying that Luke was a Gentile? We can't say for sure. We only know that the Bible doesn't say categorically one way or another. But if Luke was a Gentile, he was the only New Testament author who was not a Jew. What I find particularly interesting about Luke, however, is that he is mentioned by name only two other times in the Bible. In 2 Timothy 4.11, only Luke is with me. And then in Philemon 1.24, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, which is the other way of saying Luke, my fellow laborers. Those are the only two times that his name is mentioned in the Bible. <clears throat> but to understand Luke's role in the Bible, you have to infer much from those three references from Paul about Luke and other cross-references between Luke's Gospel, the book of Acts, which he, he also wrote, and other books in the Bible. Now, our author provides a lot of conclusions, but spares us the details of those studies. But from what I could gather, those studies can be very in-depth. What we do know from these studies is that Luke was Paul's companion on part of Paul's second and third missionary journeys. Luke was also along on Paul's trip to Rome. These experiences with Paul surely helped him understand the gospel. 
He saw firsthand the spread of the gospel. He witnessed countless lives changed by the power of God's word and Christ's finished work on the cross. Just as we can't say for sure that Luke wrote the gospel, we also can't say for sure when it was written. The most widely held belief is that Luke wrote it sometime after the third missionary journey while Paul was under arrest in Caesarea. It's also possible that Luke didn't finish it until arriving in Rome with Paul. While these are, while these are more aspects of Luke's gospel we can't verify, we can be certain of some very important facts. Luke's experiences as a missionary influenced his writing as he wrote under the direction of the Holy Spirit. So let's pick up the story in Acts 16.6. Now by this time, on the second missionary journey, Timothy has joined Paul and Silas. They're bouncing around Asia Minor, what we now know as Turkey. Acts 16.6. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. After they were come to Mysia, or Mysia, I guess, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas. Now here's where Paul has a vision of a man from Macedonia asking for help. Verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel unto them. Now Macedonia was primarily Roman. Philippi, the capital of the province, was a Roman colony, making it kind of like a little Rome. The Romans used their dominant status to influence the entire province. And the absence of a synagogue in the city indicates that few Jews lived there. So question, what did God communicate about the gospel by calling the missionaries to a place like Macedonia? Any, any guesses? Any? Yeah, yeah. The gospel is for everyone. God was as concerned about reaching the Romans as he was about reaching the Jews. I think those are fairly safe conclusions to draw. <clears throat> so let's follow their journey to Macedonia, shall we? The best way to get to Macedonia from Troas is across the Aegean Sea, a journey of about 120 miles. So we pick it up in verse 11. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia. That's an island in the Aegean, about a third of the way uh, across the sea. And the next day to Neapolis, which is the port city of of Macedonia on the Aegean. And from thence to Philippi, which is about 10 miles inland, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. So based on the details in his gospel and other references, it's here in Philippi that Luke probably joined the missionary team. And their time in Macedonia was certainly eventful, starting in verse 13. And on the Sabbath we went out of the city by a riverside, where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Lydia here is known as a seller of purple. That's clothing or other items dyed purple. In those days... The only purple dyes were exceedingly expensive. Now, I was curious, what makes purple so expensive? Well, to make enough dye to color something just the size of a scarf, Lydia would have to make about half an ounce of dye in its powder form. The dye came from glands extracted from sea snails that lived in the shallow coastal waters. These snails were about the size of a golf ball. Now, this is what really opened my eyes here. 
To make that half an ounce of dye, she would have to catch about 1,400 pounds of sea snails for every half an ounce of dye. It would then take a few months to process those snails into the dye powder. This process is complex and was a highly guarded secret. In fact, there are no complete records of the process that exists today. But through, the years of through years of trial and error, a handful of people today have managed to recreate the dyes that Lydia produced. But back then, it's estimated that a single ounce of that purple dye would have cost the equivalent of three pounds of gold. That's why purple was called royal purple. Only the wealthiest could afford it. Lydia was certainly noteworthy and without question a very wealthy woman. In today's, in today's vernacular, we would probably call her an influencer. Her conversion would certainly have been the talk of the town. But that wasn't the only big to-do in Macedonia. Let's pick it up in verse 16. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. We know what transpired after that. <clears throat> it caused the event, that event caused Paul and Silas to be tossed in jail. And over the next... 2,000 years, those result, the resulting events from that have inspired untold numbers of sermons. So let's pick up that story just for, to remind us in verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, oops, pardon me, uh, that's a neighbor I, I have to put her on hold, <clears throat> so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and the keeper of the prison awaking out of his sleep, seeing the prison doors open, and he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, and sprang in, and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out, and said, Sirs, what must, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they speak unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in the, his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them un into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Now, we don't know where Luke was when Paul and Silas were witnessing to the Gentiles in Philippi, but we can be confident that Luke was well aware of these events, and he would have heard reports of the salvation decisions that were rocking the city. So question, what types of people did the gospel reach in Philippi? Well, obviously it reached the Gentiles, but they were women, the rich, the poor, even the roughest of men. That you can be assured that the, uh, the prison guards were, were not gentlemen, as we would call them today. Luke was with Paul when he returned to Jerusalem to give a detailed report of all that God had done among the Gentiles during the third missionary journey. Now, having accompanied Paul on parts of that journey, and then hearing all that happened on the rest of the journey, Luke would have been convinced that the gospel is far-reaching and its invitation open to all. So another question. How else might Luke's travels throughout the Roman Empire have affected his outlook on the gospel and the ministry of Christ? I'm seeing blank stares. Okay. <laughs> he would have been convinced beyond doubt that Christ indeed came to seek and to save the lost, regardless of their ethnicity, background, station in life. <clears throat> so that's the, the authorship of Luke. So let's now look at Luke, the writer. 
and at the very start of his gospel, chapter 1, verse 1. For as much as, as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Luke was a careful and thorough researcher. Look at verse 1. He consulted other accounts about Christ. He probably used the Gospels of Matthew and Mark as references. And we do know that those accounts were written by eyewitnesses, as mentioned in verse 2. Verse 2 also uses ministers of the word. Here, word refers to the message of the Gospel. Under the direction of the Holy Spirit, Luke wrote an orderly account of all things from the first. That's in verse 3 or that is the beginnings of Jesus' ministry. He wrote what the eyewitnesses saw and reported about Christ. Luke said that he had perfect understanding and that he wrote the account in order. Now, in the original language, understanding means to trace carefully. And so perfect understanding would mean that Luke was precise and accurate in his writing. The phrase, the phrase, in order, conveys the idea that Luke was systematic in the way he arranged the events he described. And as an engineer, I really appreciate things done systematically. Luke's stated goal of his careful research and description of events was so Theophilus, and that's interesting too, his Theophilus means lover of God, so that Theophilus could be confident of what he had already learned about Christ's words and deeds. We don't know whether Theophilus was a recent convert or was on the verge of being saved. But either way, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, which again Luke also wrote, would have helped Theophilus in expanding his understanding and deepening his faith. Now besides Theophilus, Luke was writing to a Gentile audience in general and new Gentile believers in particular. For instance, he used the context of world politics as the setting for Christ. The Gentiles, especially the Greeks, were often very aware of politics. They probably had talk shows about politics before we even thought of them. <clears throat> he also wrote as if the reader would not have been familiar with the places and geography of Israel. And he quoted from the Greek translation of what is now our Old Testament. And the number of appearances of God-fearers in both Luke and Acts suggests that Luke had them in mind as he wrote. So why did he write? Let's talk about Luke's purposes. That's main point number two. Many Gentiles of Luke's time left the traditional pagan gods to seek hope and security in the mystical religions of the East. Luke's message... His message of the Son of Man, who lived and walked the earth, who showed almost incomprehensible love for people, even those who hated him, would have intrigued the Gentiles. And Luke wrote with obvious conviction. He communicated in ways that made his message real, not some fanciful fairy tale. So among his purposes was part, part A here, letter A, to present Jesus as the perfect God-man. Now, in a previous lesson, we saw how Matthew's gospel starts with Christ's genealogy, showing the 42 generations from Abraham to Jesus. Matthew's genealogy of Jesus was directed at a Jew Jewish audience to emphasize Christ's identification with the Jewish people. Chapter 3 of Luke's gospel, on the other hand, provides another genealogy of Christ, but Luke traces Christ's family tree all the way back to Adam to emphasize that Jesus identified with all mankind. Now his genealogy uses Mary's line of descendants as opposed to Joseph's, and that directly connects Jesus with humanity. And that connection with 
humanity is the, is the emphasis throughout the rest of Luke's gospel. Luke's depiction of Christ as the Son of Man is perhaps the portrait of him we can most readily identify with, given our puny, mortal, finite minds. We try to grasp Christ's eternal deity. Jesus always was and always will be. That's hard to put our, to wrap our minds around, I know. We struggle to comprehend how he can be God and man at the same time. We can only accept by faith that Jesus is an equal part of the Trinity, one God with three distinct personalities. We can only ponder his absolute sovereignty, his humbling, his king of kings status. We believe all those things, but we have little to hang our hats on other than faith. But when we see Jesus as the Son of Man, he becomes more approachable, more identifiable, more tangible. We see Jesus in activities and circumstances, experiencing emotions, hunger, pain, fatigue, thirst, and all things human. We can relate to him then personally. It allows us <clears throat> excuse me, to truly understand his compassion, his care, and his love for us. Luke's attention for the birth of Christ is unmatched by any other gospel. Throughout Luke's telling, we are given the opportunity to consider Jesus as a baby. And I, I love how the author of our study points this out. <clears throat> we, by considering Jesus as a baby, we can imagine being able to hold him, to rock him to sleep, to sing him a lullaby, to feed him pureed carrots, <laughs> to play peekaboo with him. These are the things that Mary and Joseph did. Jesus laid in their arms as they looked into his eyes and felt love for him. We can imagine those things because we have such a human depiction of Jesus' birth. So what comes to mind, to your mind, when you think of Jesus' birth? Anybody got any other, any other thoughts? I kind of ran out here after I finished my list, so I'm not going to come up with any, any more. <coughs> Luke also includes the account in the temple of Jesus as a boy, starting in uh, chapter 2, verse 46. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt with, thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. Jesus amazed the scholars with his knowledge and understanding. That was an early indication that Jesus was no ordinary man. Luke also includes instances of Jesus doing very human activities. He was praying in, in chapter 516, eating with others in 529 and 736. Jesus even compassionately interrupts a funeral. Let's look at Luke 7, starting in verse 11. And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him, and much people. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the bier, and they, sat, and they that bare him stood still, and he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. This shows not only Jesus' compassionate humanity by attending a funeral, but his compassionate divinity by raising the young man from the dead. Luke's gospel provides us other insights to Christ's life by relating several parables that are found nowhere else in the Bible. Now, far from being impractical or just nice stories, they stress areas of life, of Jesus' life, that translate vividly today. 
The parable of the Good Samaritan, for instance, illustrates what it means to love one's neighbor, regardless of how your neighbor may have treated you. The parables of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the prodigal son show Christ's love for lost sinners, a love that we, by the way, should all be emulating. As Jesus entered into Jerusalem, he wept over the city, knowing what was to come because of their stubborn refusal to believe in him. Luke is the only writer to include this point. And by doing so, Luke underscores Jesus' humanity and helps us make that connection with him. But Jesus' humanity is perhaps best seen in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night he was betrayed and arrested. Let's pick this up in Luke 22, starting in verse 39. And he came out and went, and he was, as, as he was wont, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, If thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. How do you see the humanity of Christ in this passage? Do you see how he feels the heavy weight of the suffering he is about to endure on the cross? Can you see how he benefits from the angels that came to strengthen him physically? You know, he didn't need any other kind of strengthening, but in his humanity, he needed to be strengthened physically. And you know, Jesus was spared none of the physical trauma of the cross. But he also suffered emotionally, too. He was stripped naked, humiliated, and nailed to that cross for all to see. He was mocked. His disciples abandoned him. I mean, just think of the kinds of things, that the emotions that he had to endure in in addition to that horrible pain. Now, while it's not in Luke's gospel, you know, just kind of on that point, you know, as we approach Easter, let's think about this too. Uh, In what other ways did, did Christ suffered emotionally while he was there? He called out to his mother, Mother, behold thy son. I just can't you know, imagine that you know, you're, you're dying in front of your mother and she's witnessing this. He's having compassion on her because of the feelings that he knows she's going through and the connection that he had with his mother. And that, you know, what, again, it's just the emotion of that moment. Um, is, you know, it, it just brings tears to my eyes and a lump in my throat. And then perhaps worst of all, God the Father, whom he's been with for all eternity, turned his back on him at that moment. And, you know, my, you know why, forsake, why hast thou forsaken me? You know, the, just the emotional trauma and the burdens that he had on that cross. Again, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's, it's part of the amazing story, I think. And I it just, the more I think about it, it's just, you know, I'm not a very emotional person, but when I do get emotional, they're pretty intense. And I just, wow. Jesus met the cross as fully human. And that's the way Paul, uh, Luke uh, describes it. And yet he was without sin. Now several times in chapter 23, Luke records Pilate's announcements of Jesus' innocence after hearing all the charges against him. Now here's an important point. Pilate's announcements didn't make Jesus innocent. Jesus was innocent whether Pilate declared it or not. Those announcements simply recognized what was already true. Now, Luke provides several instances at Golgotha where Christ speaks kindly to others. In 23, starting in verse 27, And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? 
Now at his moment of crucifixion, which has to be, have been beyond excruciating, and that word, by the way, excruciating comes from the word crucifixion, we see in Luke 23, 33, and when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand, the other on the left. Then said Jesus, while they're crucifying him, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and they parted his raiment and cast lots. The thief on the cross, of course, is another example of kind words that Jesus spoke during this ordeal. In 2342, And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into my, thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Then in Christ's final hours, Luke tells us, in starting in verse 44, And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now after witnessing all that happened that day, a centurion, a Roman soldier who commanded a hundred soldiers, that's where the word centurion comes from, he could come to only, that centurion could come to only one conclusion, and we see this in Luke 23, 47. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, certainly this was a righteous man. Christ's righteousness in the form of man. Luke's account of the events leading up to and during the crucifixion paint a vivid portrait of Jesus in all his humanity. Then, after his resurrection, Luke chapter 24 recounts Jesus' appearance to, to his disciples. He further emphasizes Jesus' humanity by telling us how Jesus told the doubting disciples to touch his body, to feel his scars, and to discover for themselves that he is indeed human flesh. He even asked them to provide him food so he could show that his presence with them was physical and that his resurrection was genuine. Another of uh, Luke's purposes here was to, point B, communicate that Jesus is the Savior of all. A first-hand witness of the power of the gospel to change lives. Remember, he, he was on those missionary journeys. Luke wrote his gospel to present Jesus as the Son of Man and Savior for all. So let's got, we have some subpoints here. One of the ways he communed, communicated that Jesus was Savior of all was, by, was at the moment of the announcement by the angels. Luke is the only writer to record what the angels announced to the shepherds on the night Jesus was born. The angels announced an event that would bring peace to the world in Luke 2.14, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Now the fact that the shepherds received this announcement would have been important to Luke and his purpose. <clears throat> you know, shepherds were, it was a lowly profession. They were almost outcasts in Israel. No one respected them. The people considered them unclean because of their occupation. So what did the shepherds do with this information they received from the angels? In, in verse 16 we see, And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. What did they do? <clears throat> the shepherds went, they saw, and they spread the news. So a question, what must the shepherds have concluded about the Savior as a result of, being, of them being chosen by God to receive and proclaim the announcement of Christ's birth? Well, I think the shepherds, knowing their station in life amongst the, 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 the Jews, they, they, that they concluded that Jesus must be the Savior of all mankind if God would have made such an announcement to men as lowly as they. Follow-up question, what did God communicate to the people of Israel by sending shepherds to announce his birth? Well, God said that he doesn't share their pre prejudices and that he was sending a savior for all people. 
<clears throat> the next way that, uh, that uh, Luke communicates that Jesus is Savior of all is in the Song of Simeon. Let's look at uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 25 through 28. Well, first, yeah, 25 through 28. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, now these, these next four verses are known as the Song of Simeon. <clears throat> Luke 29. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. This reflects Luke's theme that Jesus is the Son of Man and is the Savior of all mankind. God's salvation of the Gentiles was not an afterthought. It wasn't plan B. From the very beginning, God intended Jesus to be the Savior of all. Mary and Joseph marveled at Simeon's song. They hadn't yet comprehended that Jesus was to be the Savior of everyone not just the Jews. And the third way that Luke communicated this was the salvation of Gentiles. In showing that Jesus, the perfect Son of Man, is the Savior of all, Luke highlights Jesus' teaching about reaching the Gentiles. In the synagogue of Nazareth, Jesus teaches from the book of Isaiah. And for the sake of time, I'll skip over those, but you can see it in Luke, starting in verse 4, 16 through verse 20. <clears throat> Jesus then elaborates by providing examples from the Old Testament where Gentiles experience God's grace. He mentions the widow of Zarephath, who was poor. He also talked about Naaman, the prestigious commander of the Syrian army. God reached out to those two Gentiles of very different backgrounds, while his people, for the most part, rejected him. How did the Jews react to what Jesus was doing here? Not well. They kicked him out of town. But by telling the story, it showed, Luke showed the Gentiles that Jesus was willing to face harsh consequences to minister to them. Then there's that great story of the centurion's servant. I think you know it well, where the centurion had a, a sick servant and he, you know, wouldn't, he, he asked for Jesus' help, but he didn't consider himself worthy of, of it. And Jesus concluded the, the, the story uh, where he says about the, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, the centurion, and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I've not, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Luke added in the same, uh, Luke added the same teaching later in, the, in his gospel, in 13, starting in 27. But he shall say, I tell you, I know not whence ye, ye are, depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. That's a reference to people from all other parts of the world. The point Luke makes here is that Christ's future kingdom will, in will include Gentiles from all over the world while some Jews will be excluded because of their unbelief. Now Luke concludes his gospel by showing Jesus explaining the reason for his death, burial, and resurrection. Luke 24, starting in verse 45. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. So let's make this personal. <clears throat> if we truly believe the gospel is for all, what evidence should there be in our lives? We should be praying, we should pray for opportunities to witness. 
We should be comfortable at sharing the gospel. We should take time to get to know people, perhaps especially people we used to shun or feel uncomfortable around. And if we believe the gospel is for all, we should be informed about our missionaries and pray for their needs. This being Missions Month, that should be on the top of our minds anyway. So to conclude here, <clears throat> Luke's gospel, written for a Gentile audience, shows us that Jesus is the Son of Man who demonstrates his humanity in countless ways. Jesus is the perfect, risen, living Savior for all. He has no corruption in him. Unlike Beethoven, Jesus has no grave, and you won't find his human body decomposing. <clears throat> Thanks, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the wonderful study that we were provided for uh, to look into Luke's gospel. We thank you, Lord, for the clarity that Luke wrote, allowing us to see Jesus' humanity and praise God that he came to save all, including we Gentiles. We thank you, Lord, for uh, your word, and we pray now that as we uh, go into the, the rest of the, the day today that you'll bless pastor as he preaches and uh, have us all be attentive, and as a result of being here today, that we know you better and love you a little more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks, folks. Um, I suppose I could. <clears throat>